And a very warm welcome everyone to our penultimate research cafe of the spring term. I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Dryden-Peterson who's joining us from the US today. So thank you Sarah for joining us at what's quite an early time in the morning um, for you over there in, in Boston. Um, Sarah is Associate Professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in the US and she's founder and director of Refugee Reach. And if you haven't already visited the REACH research um, website, I would highly recommend the website. It brings together educators, researchers, policymakers, and there's a host of really fabulous co-created resources and blogs on the theme of um, refugee education. So I um, highly recommend that. And Sarah also teaches courses on qualitative research methods and education in armed conflict and um, education in times of uncertainty. And I'm sure most of you here are familiar with Sarah's work, but um, I'm just going to mention that she's just recently published a book, Right Where We Belong, How Refugee Teachers and Students Are Changing the Future of Education. Um, and I'm waiting for my copy um, to arrive and I'm, I'm sure Sarah's going to talk about it today. So we're at a very exciting moment. So the title of Sarah's talk today is Refugee Education, Taking Stock of Our Field. Um, Sarah's going to talk for about 40 minutes or so and then we're going to have time for a short buzz and then come back as a whole group for questions and answers. So um, Sarah, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Linda. It's just great to be here with you all today. I'm going to share my slides and you'll see um, the cover of the book as Linda was talking about, mostly because I actually just love what the designers um, did with the artwork here. Um, this is art created by children, um, which, which makes me happy um, to look at. Um, and I'm just also really glad to be here today. I love the way these research cafes are structured and really looking forward to discussion. Um, I thought today as we think about the field of refugee education and taking stock of where we are and what we want to envision collectively for the future, I would share some of what I have learned through writing this book, um, which, as Linda said, has just come out. Um, I also wanted to just acknowledge that we're together remotely today, but also in person, um, and that in thinking about displacement and migration, so essential to think about where we do this work from and the lands that are colonized, unceded, and stolen, and hope that in person and remotely that we can take time always to recognize the peoples whose lands we're on and the relationships and responsibilities that we have to this land, each to one another, um, and a theme that I'll talk about today to the kind of entangled pasts that we have, the present moment that we co-create together and the futures that I believe we have responsibility to co-create together as well. So this question um, that's on the center of the screen there, I can see the classroom, um, is the question that really drives this book right where we belong. It's also the one that really motivates my work and keeps me up at night. So it is what would it take to ensure that all displaced young people have access to learning that enables them to feel a sense of belonging and prepares them to help build more peaceful and equitable futures. I'm going to begin with some context on the dilemmas that have shaped the substance and method of the way that I do my work, um, and then talk about the arc of the book. These are the chapter titles that you see in the quadrants here. Um, so beginning with Our Futures, I'll explain why I felt like this kind of a book was needed now, and then go to talking about sanctuary and power, particularly the limited spaces in which refugees find refuge, and how power operates in migration and education experiences. I'll then continue with the purposes of refugee education, moving us from what I think often feels like the limits of what's possible with this kind of limited sanctuary to a view of what teachers and students doing the daily work see as the purposes of education. Um, and then finally to learning and belonging, ways in which teachers and students are figuring out what it actually does take to create equitable quality education for refugees and going into depth on a few illustrative examples from each of these concepts to, that the book addresses. I'm gonna conclude with a framework that I hope can be a focus of discussion um, in ways that it might point research policy and practice in new and productive directions. 
for how we really act on the kinds of inequalities that we observe in access and in learning in order to expand opportunities. And this brings me to the essential context. If my slides will move forward, let's see here. Oh, hold on. There it goes backwards and now it goes forwards. Great. Um, so I wanted to talk about context in these three buckets of access, learning and opportunity. Um, today, 48, 58 million children are out of school habitually. Obviously, this has changed dramatically during the pandemic. Um, and this number of out of school children actually represents massive progress down from 99 million in 2000. But I think it's important that we continue to consider who is left out and along what lines that exclusion operates. And we know that almost half of children globally who still do not have access to education on a regular basis live in conflict and in displacement. In terms of learning, we also know that there are massive inequities globally in access to even foundational reading and numeracy skills. Our work in Kenya has documented early grade literacy outcomes among refugees to be among the lowest in the world. And I'll talk today about ways that refugees experience exclusion from languages, from curricula, and from relationships with teachers and peers. Access to education and learning in theory enables opportunity. But of course, we know that opportunities are tied to structures, including legal, social, and political conditions and power. In almost all countries where refugees live, they are non-citizens, likely never citizens. Conditions that really limit their access to equitable educational and post-schooling opportunities, especially with limited rights to education, to work, to capital, and to long-term residence. This is a typical classroom in a refugee camp in terms of the number of students and the infrastructure. 30% of refugees globally live in Africa. This is standard one from where I am in the US, the equivalent of grade one, one of the very first years of school in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya in 2018. But there's also wide variation in refugee education globally. Not all refugees live in camps like Kakuma. Today, more than 60% of refugees live in cities. This is a class of grade nine Syrian students in Beirut, Lebanon in 2019. The Syrian students in that photo are some of now almost 27 million refugees globally. The number of refugees globally has grown since World War II and it continues to grow as we've seen by almost 4 million people in the last month. We expect these numbers to increase further both with climate change and with political instability globally. Importantly, where refugees live is not equally distributed. UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, reports that 73% of refugees live in neighboring host countries. So Syrians primarily in Turkey and Lebanon, Congolese in Uganda, and 86% of refugees live in countries classified as low and middle income countries with fewer resources for social services, such as education. These neighboring host countries that have already overstretched education systems are the primary examples and sites that I examine in the book, Right Where We Belong. For comparison, in 2017, 25% of the population in Lebanon was a refugee, compared to less than 0.1% in the United States. In 2019, only 1,198 refugees from Afghanistan were admitted to the US, while almost 1.5 million Afghan refugees continued to live in Pakistan, many for more than 20 years. This long-term displacement, as I know that Maha talked about in a recent cafe as well, is a really central dimension of refugee education. Once displaced, 80% of refugees are displaced for at least five years, and 20% for over 20 years, which is three times as long as in the early 1990s. This length of displacement means that exile is the one and only chance that refugee children have for education. I think about Abrun, who was one of our research participants in Kenya, who thought he would quickly return to Somalia after he had fled with his family. But 21 years later, he was still in Kenya. This expectation of short-term displacement, but the reality of long-term displacement 
is present for individual refugees like Abrun and also for agencies making refugee policy. You can see here are photos of Dadaab camp in Kenya in the top left on your screen there in 1992, which was built then as a temporary shelter for 90,000 refugees and without schools. The photo below is Dadaab almost 20 years later in 2011, when it hosted more than 450,000 refugees, making it the third largest city in Kenya. These dilemmas of access, learning and opportunity as well as the geographies of where refugees live and their long-term, often lifetime displacement, present urgent sets of policy and practice challenges in the field of education. Ones that I think demand the building of new frameworks for thinking and action. Typically in global education research and policy, access, learning, and opportunity are conceptualized as a kind of sequential and linear model, as you see here. With access comes learning, with learning comes opportunity. My hope is that this book contributes to the research of many, but shows we need to think about these three in integrated ways, with many challenges of policy and practice rooted in the way we conceptualize how they link together. Exploring these interrelationships among access, learning, and opportunity was one motivation for writing this book. Another motivation was that I felt the need for work that was not bounded by the very same country borders that often cause conflict in the first place. I wanted my work to really reflect this essential idea that refugees are living transnational lives and that movement across places, both real and aspirational, is really key to understanding educational experiences. The map here on the screen represents the context that I address in the book, trying to bring together nine discrete research studies, including 15 years of ethnographic research in schools and more than 600 interviews in 23 countries. A third motivation for the book was that I hoped a book would open possibilities for developing concepts that really did link across time, across place, and across ideas and the power and politics of each of these, time, place, and ideas, in order to point research policy and practice in new and productive directions for how we act on the inequalities that we continue to observe in both access and learning in order to expand opportunities. In particular, what I was seeing and wanted to explore is how education can link together the histories and identities of young people that they bring to school, the experiences that they have daily in school, and the future building that they hope education helps them to engage in, not in each of these past, present, future separately, but consistently linked together. Overall, I was finding that a book was needed for the future because I think our field of refugee education is entering a stage where these connections across time, between places, among ideas, is going to be essential for us to deepen our learning about and our acting on some of the persistent inequities that shape education for refugee young people. I'm gonna to turn to talking about sanctuary and power through the history of refugee education. As I talked about in the geographies of displacement, sanctuary for refugees is grim globally and incredibly unjust. So 73% of refugees live in neighboring host countries. And in so many situations, this, these are really policies of confinement, policies, borders, walls, placed by high income countries to intentionally keep people out. How power operates in refugee education is shaped by these experiences of limited sanctuary. When I began my research in this field, the prevailing view among global and national organizations and in nascent what then was mostly agency conducted research was that education for refugees was really a holding ground designed to create a more stable present, but to, to defer any kind of creation of a future. Most refugees had access only to separate schools for refugees, isolated from national education systems, and with the intention of providing temporary schooling with short-term goals. I was struck by how little this approach aligned with both the long-term nature of displacement and the kinds of education that I observed refugee communities creating for their children in terms of building connections to national education systems and to purposes aligned to the futures that they imagine 
in the context of politics and conflict in their home countries and their host countries, clearly oriented towards long-term goals. In the book, I wanted to understand what I was observing empirically and how we arrived at the current place of refugee education. So in historical analysis, I began to see that what I was perceiving as new developments in refugee education really reflected what refugee education had looked like after World War II in what I came to call the era of liberation. This was a time of independent struggles across Africa and Asia, and refugee education was explicitly designed to reflect post-independence futures imagined for young people. So for example, Zimbabwe and then Rhodesian refugees in Botswana explicitly organized schools to prepare leaders of a future independent Zimbabwe. 1985 marked a major shift towards governance of refugee education by global institutions. This was the era in which refugee camps were really invented, like the photos you saw of Dadaab. So refugees were necessarily segregated from nationals for their education. The presumed future by global actors who funded and ran refugee schools at this time was a swift return to the country of origin. So education was seen as temporary and children learned with the curricula and languages of their home countries. But the reality of displacement was protracted. This was the time of initial displacements of Congolese refugees to Uganda, many of whom still live there. Somalis to Kenya, like Abrun, many of whom still live there. Afghans to Pakistan, many of whom still live there. So while global policies did not reflect this long-term reality, what I was finding was that local practices and teaching and learning in schools did. What I observed to be happening at this time, I came to call localization, a common term now back in vogue. Teachers and students resisted against the approaches that did not reflect their realities or their purposes for education. For example, Rafael, an NGO staff member in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, pointed to the generations of young people who had been born in Kakuma camp, explaining how their experiences were misaligned with the emergency practices of refugee assistance. Rafael said, we can't keep talking about emergency if people have been here for 20 years. So when you design things that are emergency in approach and in context, then you are not addressing my needs as I grow up. Responding to these realities, teachers in Kakuma began to teach the Kenyan curriculum in English and to advocate for students to be eligible to take Kenyan national exams. Bringing together what I was seeing in this historical research and the processes that teachers and students were engaged in, I worked with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees on a new education strategy that embraced a formal approach of including refugees in national education systems, a process of engagement trying to bring together research and policy that I describe in the book. This approach in the 2012-2016 UNHCR education strategy can seem ordinary from a place like the US where I am or the UK where many of you are, where refugees who have status have legal access to schools. But prior to this time, UNHCR had no formal relationships with ministries of education. By 2016, there, though, there were formal agreements between UNHCR and national ministries of education in 20 of the 25 largest refugee hosting countries. And these agreements included access to national schools. So this is really where we are now in this era of nationalization, where by policy, refugees have access to national education systems. This radical shift in global policy to integrate refugees in national education systems really led me to new questions. And so here we are back at this organizing diagram of the book. These new questions were about the purposes of education within this policy of opening of systemic access to education for refugees. The new movement to include refugees in national education systems really rested on the idea that this inclusion would address refugees' unknowable futures. It would provide the kind of educational stability and quality that was needed in long-term displacement. That line of thinking followed from the idea that the purposes of education within national systems would or could align for nationals and for refugees. 
I'll talk briefly now about one comparative study of 14 countries that I also discuss in the book. And this was collaborative work with Michelle Bellino, Vidur Chopra, and Elizabeth Edelman. We, we found, what we found was not one, but multiple models of inclusion of refugees in national education systems. And we found that these models reflected purposes for education for refugees that really diverged from purposes for nationals. In particular, that the models aligned with futures that policymakers envisioned for refugees, those futures being elsewhere. Overall, we find evidence of structural integration, making national education available to refugee young people, but little attention to the relational integration processes that undergird learning, belonging, and opportunity. In this case, we examined 14 refugee hosting countries that you see here on the map. The study was comparative at multiple levels, so horizontal across countries, vertical across global, national, and local levels, and transversal over time, set in the history I just described. We were really interested in understanding how the approach of including refugees in national education systems was understood, adapted, and acted on in each country context. At the global level, we found two non-negotiables, access and quality. But we also learned that there was the expectation that within these non-negotiables, the country strategies would look quite different one from the other. On the one hand, the strategy was the mother document, but a UNHCR staff member at headquarters emphasized the goal to think of the strategy as a verb and not a noun, as active and not static. At the national level, we identified a taxonomy of imagined futures for refugees and different models of inclusion that followed from these imagined futures. The imagined futures really underscore the broad unknowability of refugees' futures. So resettlement to a third country, such as the US, which is an option for only 1% of refugees globally. Return, which is uncertain given this long-term displacement. Integration, which is often politically untenable given conditions in host countries, but also the focus of a lot of contemporary refugee policy, including what we were studying, the inclusion of refugees in national schools. And transnationalism, which I see across the work in this book as an aspiration, a future that young people prepare for as a way to navigate the limited opportunities that they perceive in all contexts. We found that these imagined futures inform the models of inclusion that were developed in each country context. In particular, we found four models of inclusion. First, there was a model of no inclusion, such as in Malaysia or Bangladesh, this was in 2018, where refugees have no legal access and no right to education. So refugees' futures were presumed to be elsewhere, return or resettlement from the very moment of arrival and only non-formal schooling was permitted in these contexts. Second and third were models of inclusion in the structural elements like access to school buildings, host country curriculum, language of instruction and certification, but in separate spaces. So geographic segregation in camps like Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia, and temporal segregation in separate shifts in the morning and the afternoon in the same schools, like in Lebanon. Fourth was a model where refugees and nationals studied together in the same schools at the same time, which we found existed in some cities. In all of these latter models of inclusion, the purposes of including refugees in national systems were largely framed as pragmatic and understood to prepare refugees with skills that could eventually support their futures, not in the host country, but elsewhere. As an NGO staff member in Kenya said, I would like refugees to go away with something. And for me, education would be key because even if they relocated to a different country today, they would go with the knowledge, they would go with a paper, something that would help them in their life and in the years to come. A government leader in Rwanda echoed this idea saying, the goal is to gain the skills that could help them in their future anywhere. At the local level, we found these same aspirations for an education that could prepare refugees for multiple possible futures, 
But these aspirations did not echo school level experiences. In examples across contexts, I show that school experiences are instead filled with lack of learning and limited opportunities. We found this, for example, in Kakuma refugee camp. Together with Ben Piper, we found some of the lowest early grade literacy outcomes in the world. Yet while refugee outcomes were low, so were those of Kenyan nationals in the same area. The experience of being included in schools that were already struggling to meet the needs of national students was a pattern we saw across all refugee hosting countries. An NGO staff member in Egypt said, there's no benefit to including Syrian refugees in a system already struggling to implement quality education. A teacher in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya said, there is no future. It gives me a divided mind whether I want to be integrated. If I am integrated as a citizen of this country, what will be my life? Will it be better or worse than the way I am now? Lack of economic and social opportunities prevented refugees like this teacher from building the futures they had hoped that their education would make possible. At the local level, teachers and students felt a lack of alignment between what they thought inclusion in national schools would mean and what they actually experienced. Before we move from this quadrant of purpose to learning and belonging, I want to tell you about Annette, who is a participant who's a protagonist in Right Where We Belong in the book. This is a drawing that she made. When Annette arrived in Uganda, she thought that her exile in the Chakatu refugee settlement would be short-lived and that she would soon return home to her home in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. But she soon looked through the faded cloth that created a door to her family's home in the camp, and she noticed that her father had planted bananas. Bananas can take up to a year to produce fruit, and she knew that he would never have planted them if, she, if he expected the family to soon return home. At school, Annette sat at the back of a class of 49 children. She was never called on to speak in class. Her teachers rarely had the chance to look at her exercise books, and she never interacted with her teachers outside of the classroom. Annette described how the national students in her class refused to sit with refugees. Nationals sat two to a bench, refugees sat four to a bench, and they knew that they could not move to even out the numbers. Yet despite what the children experienced, a Ugandan NGO worker in the camp explained the rationale for not collecting data on ethnicity. When they come here, she said, we ask them not to be their nationalities anymore. Instead, each day, Annette stood in front of the Ugandan flag in the school's compound. In the middle of this picture is the flag that she drew before telling me about how she felt about it in an interview. She sang the national anthem, O oh, Uganda, the land of freedom. O oh, Uganda, the land that feeds us. I'd watched Annette sing loudly when she arrived at this line, we lay our future in thy hand. Yet as she laid her hand in the future, her future in the hands of the state, she soon came to realize that her future could not be of the state. For the next five years after I met her, Annette continued to go to school every day. When she stopped at age 18, she was not allowed to vote. She was not allowed to own property. And since she did not have the right to work, she would not be able to practice as a nurse as she had once dreamed about. Instead, she still lived in the same refugee camp and was a subsistence farmer, tending, among other crops, the family's bananas. I came to ask, what's the value of including refugees in schools that are already failing nationals? And even in a best case scenario where refugees are able to access high quality education within national education systems, what are these unequal opportunity structures that limit their futures? These questions catapulted me into the final chapters of the book that focus on learning and belonging. The shift in approach, opening access to national schools for refugees, I think has marked a major opportunity for structural integration, addressing not completely, but still significantly, certain core dimensions of refugees' educational marginalization, namely their access to education. But what I began to see were persistent dilemmas of relational integration, 
that closely mirror the experiences of other marginalized children globally, including where I live now in Boston, where I grew up in Toronto, alienation from curriculum, exclusion and discrimination in relationships with teachers and peers, and lack of alignment between the promises of getting educated and limited opportunities for equitable social, civic, economic, and political participation. As a window into these questions, I look at examples in the book from South Africa, Lebanon, Kenya, and Canada. I'm gonna talk about one example from Dadaab, Kenya, which is based on collaborative work with Nagin Daya and Elizabeth Edelman. What I describe in the book counters two prevailing ideas. First, that refugees are reliant on international humanitarian aid structures for educational success. And second, that few educational supports are accessible in refugee communities. We also documented ties between diaspora and their countries of origin, a transnational movement of educational resources. We found that refugees drew on both locally and globally situated resources for their education through transnational relationships with Somali diaspora, particularly with former teachers. We also found that these transnational relationships really shifted what refugee students learned, reformulating the ecological systems model that so dominates thinking and education to respond to 21st century phenomenon of migration and communication. When we began this work, existing research on experiences of refugees focused primarily on the failure of systems and lack of opportunities. And there was no question that systems were failing and there was lack of opportunities. In Dadaab at this time, only 2.3% of refugees had access to secondary school. Without ignoring these immense challenges, we wanted to learn more about what factors actually supported success. So purposefully working against a kind of deficit oriented framing, we examined the educational trajectories of refugee students who had been successful in their education, which we defined as graduating from secondary school. Like all of my research, the methods of this study followed from a basic tenet of qualitative research, that when you ask people about their lives, they appear to know a lot about what's going on. But people sharing with an outside researcher these thoughts and meaning making is not always or ever obvious. The context in which I do my research and perhaps in which all of you do yours are defined by conflict, by lack of trust, and by long time exertion of power by outsiders, usually white outsiders like myself, in the forms of colonialism and war that have devastating consequences on children's lives. Survival while living as a refugee can depend on navigating these forms of power and details shared when talking about one's life can often backfire in high stakes decisions on resource allocation and migration status. I've been mistaken for being interested in trading arms for diamonds by association. Aren't all Canadians with interests in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo engaged in this work? And on a much more micro level, the constant power negotiation of why, for example, like in this photo, I get the cushy chair while head teachers insist that their students take the hard wooden chairs. My own positionality or social positions in any research sites and the work I'm describing today is a really essential part of how I design research, build relationships and interact in field sites and analyze data. I find that my experiences and identities are resources for asking questions, for developing relationships, for probing meaning, for pursuing silences and making sense of contradic contradictions. This concept of the researcher as integrally embedded in the research is why in the book, in my talking about my work, I'm often present in the way I talk about research and write about research. These dynamics also mean that being in a position to collect reliable, meaningful data involves months and sometimes years of engagement in a possible site of research to build these relationships and trust and to understand the kinds of contextual contours of the phenomenon we are studying and to always be asking the question of how I could be wrong. Close collaborations with professors, government leaders, teachers and students in each context, I have found really essential to this kind of work. In the study in Dadaab, 
our listening to young people led us to very different kinds of questions than we had anticipated asking from the literature. Yes, we heard about important scholarships provided by international humanitarian organizations, about classrooms that used to be under the trees and then moved to permanent school structures with the aid of international NGOs. But we also began to hear that key supports for education were people and that these people were Somali, but they did not live in Dadaab. In Right Where We Belong, I expand on how essential the idea that refugees are living transnational lives is to understanding educational experiences and the policies and practices that shape them. Across studies, I have found that while refugee policies are premised on these punctuated migration trajectories, flight now, return later, most refugee young people are in processes of continual migration, shaped by shifting migration policies and also by the search for opportunities. This map from the book shows some of the transnational movements of my research participants. Through this transnational methodological approach, we found that both locally and globally situated resources made access to education possible. As one of our participants said, the world has assisted us. But we learned that it was the microsystem relationships that served as enablers to persist and succeed in learning and graduating from secondary school. We found that refugee students have access to multi-sided, these local and global relationships made possible by migration patterns and diasporic interactions. Most of these virtual relationships actually stemmed from initial face-to-face -face relationships. Through migration, the relationship shifted in nature, in particular in relation to the type of social capital they could provide. Refugee students accessed information and academic and social support from relationships now situated outside the camps, outside these rigid borders placed around refugees that they didn't readily find within their local ecosystem. For example, sending essays to Somali refugees, now university students in Canada, who read them and provided feedback. These naturally occurring relationships reflect the principles of bonding and bridging social capital. Students leveraged bonding relationships based on shared language, history as a refugee in Dadaab and Somali origin, as the basis on which to cultivating bridging relationships across geographies and resource contexts in order to expand opportunities. Teachers who migrated and stayed connected to their former students, we found to play a particularly interesting role in what students learned and the meaning they made of that learning. One participant described a former teacher who was resettled to Canada who had also lost his parents at a young age. He said to this student, your parents have passed away. So you study, so you have a good future. Tomorrow, you may even become a president. Students described how their former teachers who had access to opportunities outside of the camps allowed them, the students, to see and act on the purposes they had for their education. In particular, these globally situated relationships supported them by recognizing the difficult past their families had experienced, understanding their present conditions and providing resources to address challenges, and supporting them to build their imagined futures, focused on contributing. Students describe this sense of purpose as a strong support for their educational success. We find that education can be a way through which to conceptualize the future, not as static or some kind of idealized place, but actually to recreate it. We found that for refugee young people, educational success was integrally tied to belonging. In particular, the kind of belonging that provides a sense of stability in the present and an ability to contribute toward the future. One participant said, one of my educational goals is to become someone, then take part in the reconstruction of Somalia. The only way we can get out of these problems is through education. This purpose for refugee education, which synthesized local and global relationships with an orientation toward contributing, really echoes the earlier liberation era of refugee education. Despite a time horizon of those contributions, 20 years of displacement on average, it can seem impossible to imagine. 
but students continued to focus on their present lives and their education in a host country as a means to meet the needs of a future that they were constantly in the process of reimagining. In Right Where We Belong in the book, I emphasize the value not only of material resources, which have been the focus of humanitarian assistance in education, but the substance of learning and its meaning both for now and for the future. In the book, I also show similar patterns across diaspora engagement, not only among Somalis in Kenya, but in Afghanistan, Haiti, South Sudan, and Zimbabwe. So here we are back at this organizer and now focused in the center. These patterns in the Kenya study and in the diaspora study were emerging really across my research, in particular how teachers and community leaders with refugee backgrounds were not only providing resources, but also re-envisioning what and how refugees' children learn. The chance in the book to analyze data across places and across time allowed me to begin developing a framework for the ways in which refugee education might act on the inequalities that we observe in access and learning in order to enable opportunity. As I've discussed, when I began my work in refugee education, the dominant global narrative was that re refugee education was temporary, this kind of holding pattern until refugees could return to a country of origin. But these are not the purposes refugee communities have for education. The purposes of refugee education in global rhetoric and analytic frames were once straightforwardly about the here and now. But this long-term work in many places shows that refugees' experiences of forced displacement and migration result in a constant navigation of this triangle, connecting histories to this dual imperative to both live in the place one is hosted from the very moment of arrival, the kind of placemaking, while also connecting that placemaking to future building, future building involving imagining and planning for multiple possible futures here, there, somewhere else entirely. Processes that are not linear and not seeking some sedentary and arrived at geographic, social, or spatial state. But of course, there are massive legal policy and xenophobic constraints on refugees' access to resources and to opportunities for both placemaking and future building. At the same time, we continue to hear from refugee young people and families that education can support navigating these barriers, particularly the misalignment between schooling in the present and opportunities in the future. I want to situate thinking about navigation among past, present, and future in a few conceptual ideas that I've been inspired in collaborative thinking with many colleagues. One is negative peace and positive peace. Johann Galtung, drawing on earlier work of Martin Luther King Jr., describes the differences between negative peace, the absence of direct violence, and positive peace, the absence of structural violence. Positive peace is thus not only the absence of violence, but also the presence of conditions that allow individuals and communities to access equal opportunities. Refugee education has typically been framed with the goal of negative peace. We saw this in the historical work with refugee education as a temporary holding ground to keep people safe until return was possible. And more recently, in different models of including refugees in national education systems that support access, but without accompanying conditions for learning, belonging, and opportunity. Another set of conceptual ideas is about what these ideas of peace might mean for refugees' experiences in schools. Social theorist Nancy Fraser outlines how access to equal opportunities requires redistribution to counter resource-based inequalities and recognition to counter identity-based inequalities. In education, redistribution to address resource-based inequalities can often happen through systems level policies, as we see in the case of policies to include refugees in national education systems. Yet as we see in the growing work in the field of refugee education, addressing identity-based inequalities can be much more challenging to institutionalize, especially in settings where refugees do not have rights and national narratives of belonging do not include them. I began to ask if disrupting identity-based inequalities could be compatible with the inclusion model of refugee education. 
What I find in Right Where We Belong is that possibilities of disrupting these inequalities are connected to perceptions of refugees' futures. From research with refugee students across contexts, we see the notion, we see that they largely actually reject the notion that they can conceptualize their futures geographically and in terms of nation states, which is, of course, how migration policies are conceptualized. While young people wish for more geographic certainty and more inclusive migration policies are essential, young people also pragmatically think through how little control they have over these kinds of policies. We've learned from young people a different way to conceptualize futures and thus purposes and experiences of education in terms of opportunities, meaning the capacity to apply what one learns across place and time and not having to choose between the present and the future, between the kinds of learning that might be deemed worthy within one education system and one present specific geography, and the kinds of opportunities one might then trade away for a reimagined future. This framework relies less on education as bounded by geography as much refugee policy is, and more on education as an enabler of opportunity. It's a shift away from a narrow focus on negative peace and resources as the framework for thinking and action, with a focus instead on identifying mechanisms by which refugee education can act on both resource and identity-based inequalities to work towards positive peace, including equitable opportunities. There's a kind of optimism in these ideas that runs pretty counter to most of what is written about refugees. I tend to share this optimism because I find it derives from the people who do the work of refugee education daily, teachers and young people. I find that their optimism is not based in ignoring reality, but instead in being so deeply engaged with it, experiencing inequalities at every turn, replicating the status quo actually becomes no option at all. So in summary, while prevailing thinking has seen refugee education as not connected to the future, instead as a short-term emergency endeavor, I argue that refugee education is a long-term situation with considerable implications for what and how children learn and the future opportunities available to them. This future orientation requires shifting our notions of the nature of sanctuary and where power is located in refugee education. A global policy and practice shift to include refugees in national education systems addresses some dimensions of access, but it prompted me to really examine the purposes of refugee education and found that opening national schools to refugees marked a major, while incomplete, opportunity for increasing access to school for refugees, but that multiple models of inclusion based on refugees' imagined futures do not enable relational integration and really expose the lack of alignment between the promises of getting educated and limited opportunities for equitable social, civic, economic, and political participation. This work has led me to reconsider questions of learning, in particular where and with whom resources for learning and belonging for refugees might be located. Resources for refugee education are often presumed to originate primarily as aid from outside the context. Yet in this book, I identify ways in which students and teachers gather and create resources from multiple sources, including transnational relationships that shift what and how they learn. Taken together, Right Where We Belong tries to look at the need to think about how education might support refugee young people to link their past, their presence, and their futures, all while in the context of unequal opportunity structures. I try to show the need to shift away from a narrow focus on negative peace, the absence of direct violence, towards identifying mechanisms by which refugee education can act on both resource and identity-based inequalities to work towards positive peace and equitable opportunities. Addressing these kinds of inequities is going to require traversing space between individuals and institutions, linking together micro, meso, and macro processes, and examining policies, curricula, pedagogies, and relationships in schools as connected to economic, political, and social opportunity structures and power.
to do this, we still have a long way to go. Um, I'm excited for our discussion today and to collaborations to continue helping to build greater understanding of these processes that might enable learning and belonging for refugee young people globally and how we might redesign our policies and institutions to more equitably reflect these goals. Thank you so much, and I'm very much looking forward to discussion. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a, you know, such a detailed overview of the state, the history and the state of refugee education. Um, and I think you've provided us with some really rich conceptual ideas and thinking, um, you know, through your framework and the linking of, of um, various ideas. And I think it was a great optimistic note that you've ended on there, because um, I share that, that optimism that refugee education is, it has the potential to be a you know, fabulous, great enabler. Um, so thank you very much.